It is good to see you in the Lord's house today. We, I think we finally got all our microphones plugged in and all that good stuff, so I think we're um, in good shape. Um, I often like to say that people will comment that they don't like organized religion. Well, if you don't like organized religion, come on down. We're about as disorganized as you can get. <laughs> so you're in the right place if you don't like organized religion. Presbyterian Women's Circles 1 and 2 will meet at 9.30 tomorrow in the Fellowship Hall. All ladies are invited to join them. Presbyterian Women's Circle 3 will meet at 5.30 on Tuesday uh, in the conference room. Daylight savings time begins next Sunday. Um, don't forget to set your clock ahead one hour before going to bed on Saturday. Most of us don't have to do that anymore. It kind of does it by itself, doesn't it? But uh, make sure that uh, it, it happened on your phone that you used to get up with. Eat, greet, eat, meet, luncheon will be at 12 noon next Sunday in the Fellowship Hall. Everyone's invited to join us for a delicious lunch of finger sandwiches, chips, fruit trays, vegetable trays, drinks, and cupcakes. Uh, just because it's Lent doesn't mean we need to suffer too much, right? Friendship pads, please take a moment to sign your name in the friendship pad, and don't forget to include any prayer requests or concerns that you may have. Are there any additional announcements that need to be made this morning that we may have overlooked? Seeing none, let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. Please stand for the call to worship. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. 
Help us to hear your word and to obey it, that we may become instruments of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Christ calls us to live our lives in harmony with our God and our neighbors. Even our best efforts fall short. Yet our God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding to steadfast love. Trusting that abundant mercy, let us confess our sins together. God of righteousness, we confess that we have not kept our commandments. We bow down before idols, declaring our allegiance to powers and principalities. We take your name in vain, using it to justify our own prejudices and opinions. We do not make adequate time to rest and remember your goodness, nor to revel in the delight of family and friends. We look the other way in the face of violence and oppression, misogyny and sexual assault, land grabs and unjust economic practices. Our dishonesty and greed get the better of us. Yet you gave us commandments, not for condemnation, but so that we might live and justify our joy. Purify us by your righteousness and enfold us in your grace. Sanctify our intentions and actions. 
that our lives may begin to reflect your beloved community. Amen. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul. God's forgiveness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The grace of Christ is sufficient for us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hello, how are y'all today? Okay, you got an assignment today to remind everybody of what God told Moses. He gave 10 commandments. Remember, they're not suggestions. They're commandments. That means you're supposed to do them. So we're gonna take turns and you're gonna read them to the congregation, okay? Mimi, would you hold the mic? So can y'all stand up? Stand up, stand up on the stairs over there and I'll hold the commandments. Stand up over there and let them see how pretty you are. I can't see that. Oh, I'm gonna get hold it to you. I'm gonna hold it for you. Stand up. Stand up. I gotta read one too. Wanna read the first one? Okay. Love God more than anything else. Don't make anything more important than God. Always say God's name with love and respect. Honor the Lord by Resting on the seventh day on the week. Love and respect your mom and dad. Never hurt anyone. Always be thankful to your husband or wife. Don't take anything that isn't yours. Always tell the truth. And be happy with what you have. Don't wish for other people's things. So these are laws that we need to um, we need to follow so that we will be have joy and happiness in our life because the Bible tells us that we get great rewards for keeping the law of the Lord and this is his laws and I like rules they're rules and I like rules rules keep us safe keep us happy keep us out of trouble right Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for our many blessings. Forgive us of our many sins. Help us to keep your rules so our lives will be filled with joy and we can go and tell others about your love. Give us courage and strength to do that and help us to um, this Lenten season to always remember that it's all about you, not us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Exodus 
chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in it, in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, not commit adultery, not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you so very much, choir. And we do come to the table of the Lord today, and that will be the center of our worship experience this morning. The second reading comes from Mark's Gospel. This is Jesus' commentary on the Ten Commandments. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all strength, and to love one neighbor, one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Then Jesus saw that he had answered wisely. He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any questions. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of this portion of his holy, sacred, and eternal word. Amen. You know, preaching on the Ten Commandments in this day and age is not easy, is it? I remember I was in central Louisiana with the National Guard and I went by a sign that I put on that made the title of today's sermon, What Part of Thou Shalt Not is Hard to Understand. That would kind of go with uh, Ellen's uh, children's message. Well, what part of it's hard to understand? But it's not the kind of stuff we like to hear anymore in our age of hyper-individualism. And sometimes it's hard to hear the Ten Commandments if you grew up in what I call a finger-pointing religion. Any of you grow up in a finger-pointing religion? And it's hard to hear them in the right way when that's how they came to you. Basically, the ministers would say, Write down everything that's fun. Now don't do any of that. And that was their summary of the Ten Commandments. Folks who build schools tell us that one of the most important things you can do is put a fence in the play area. And you say, why? Children play much better if there's a fence. They know how far they can go and not any farther and be safe. So, but inside of that play yard, they can play soccer, they can play basketball, they can play chase, they can run, they can exercise. There's lots of freedom in the space, just a boundary that says don't go beyond this. I think that's what God is doing when he gives us Ten Commandments. He's giving us lots of space to play, but telling us don't go beyond this point. Our need for boundaries can even be seen in our sports. You know, whenever they throw a sideline pass, what happens? They stop everything. They say the play is being challenged on the field. And then they begin looking at the camera from every angle. Did his big toe go over the boundary line? Did he go over the boundary? If so, then that beautiful pass that he made doesn't count because his toe went over the boundary. The only way to make progress down the field is to stay in bounds. That's what God is telling us in the Ten Commandments. The only way we're ever going to make any progress as a people and personally is if we stay in bounds. That's the idea here. Now it's important to remember that the Ten Commandments are, are written to believers. They're not something we're supposed to cram down the throats of people who don't believe them. But they are for us the very word of, the God, of God. In the ancient world, the king would take over an area and he would establish a covenant. And a covenant was just simply where he would write down what he was going to do and they would write down what the people were going to do. So he'd say, 
I'm going to protect you from enemies, people who try to invade our country. And you, in turn, are going to pay me taxes. They call them tithes in the biblical world. You're going to pay me tithes of your produce and your sheep and any money that you make. And in exchange, I'm going to protect you. And then they would take this, write it on stones, and put it in the house of their idols in front of the place where the idol stood on the stand, right in front of the idol. Of course, God had no idol, so they placed it in the Holy of Holies in what was called God's footstool, the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the idea of covenant comes from. They would cut a covenant into stone and say what God agreed to do and what the people agreed to do. One of the commentaries that I read this week said that it's designed to protect the fabric of society from tearing. Now, since we all write sermons out of our personal history, I couldn't help but read those words and remember why they are so meaningful to me. When I was growing up, it was the 1960s. One or two of you may be old enough to remember the 1960s. Just one or two as I look at this incredibly youthful congregation. But... <laughs> One or two of you may be old enough to remember the 1960s. And we went through this phase where we wore these striped pants. Striped pants with huge bell bottoms at the bottom. Any of you remember those? The bell bottoms were so big you had to take two steps to move forward one step. That's how big the bell bottoms were. Huge bell bottoms at the bottom. I would be so embarrassed to wear them now. but. In that day, they were groovy, they were cool, they were out of sight. And I went to Woodland Junior High School in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wearing my new groovy pants. Well, I'm walking down the hall, feeling pretty great. I go up to my locker, and I had a locker down at the bottom. I squatted down to get my books, and as they would say in the Navy, from bow to stern, those pants ripped open. I mean, not just a little bit, not just a little tear, all the way to where nothing was in the breeze except flapping except my fruit of the looms. That was it. So, what can you do? I stood up against the locker till the bell rang and everybody kind of cleared out. Then I worked my way down to the office I went in, not no, hoping, praying, Lord, help there not be many people. There were about eight people in the office. And it was one of my peers, a fellow student, they would give us little jobs to do. And uh, she was there greeting people and kind of sorting things out initially. So I walked in and I said, I need to call my mother. Well, that's not allowed. Why do you need to call your mother? My pants ripped. This girl, my peer, turned around and said, Sanders here says his pants ripped. Can he call his mother for that? I blushed all over. Finally, yes, my mother did get the message days before cell phones and she came and that's why you'll see me to this day wear Levi's. You know why I wear Levi's? Because they have rivets. They're going to hold together. And so I got rid of those pants and I now wear Levi's. So when it says tear the fabric, that was what came back to my mind. But the Ten Commandments are exactly that. They keep the fabric of our society in place to the degree that we keep them. They can rip vertically and horizontally. Vertically, the first five commandments have to do with our relationship with God, and the final five have mostly to do with our relationships with one another. So they are designed to keep the fabric together in both directions, both horizontally and vertically. Now, sermons have been written on each and every one of these commandments, and I've even preached a few, but today I'd like to borrow an image from the previous chapter where God says, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Let's look at the Ten Commandments from 10,000 feet. Let's look at the overall thrust of what they are saying and ask ourselves what can they teach us. If I had to put it into one sentence, it would be this. God and humans are not useful. 
Now what do I mean by that? Not useful. In a few minutes, we're going to gather around the Lord's table for communion. And we're going to say something called the Great Thanksgiving. The Great Thanksgiving has been around for many, many, many centuries. The one that we use dates back to 1660, the Anglican Church, Book of Common Prayer. And you know what they used to say for the Great Thanksgiving? They would say, it is meat right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee. Isn't that beautiful? Kind of wish we said it like that now. If you grew up in the Anglican Church, Church of England, then you know exactly that that's how you used to say it. Meet and right means that it's just the right thing to do. You don't do it for any useful reason. You do it just because it's the right thing to do to praise and honor and worship God. The purest kind of worship, the purest kind of worship is when we don't ask God anything. We just simply worship adore and praise God. That is the best worship we can ever offer. One person looks at another and says, thanks. The other one says, for what? And the other one says, thanks for being you. Isn't that the highest praise we can give to another person? Well, guess what? The highest praise we can give to God is to say, thanks God for being you. No usefulness there at all. Just praising him and thanking him. Now, in some way, I can't really explain when we worship God for no other reason than the fact God is God, it carries over into the way we treat others. I can't really explain why. For example, honor your father and mother. This is written, by the way, to adults, not to children. And it's meant to say that you honor them not because they can give you things anymore, but you honor them simply because of who they are. They're not useful anymore, even more reason to honor them. Now, I recognize that all families are different, and some of us fall far short of this, but it is the beautiful image and the goal toward which we should move. I was writing my sermon this week, and Claire on Wednesday took her father, 90 years old, he's had several strokes, to the dentist. And I see Virginia survived the dentist, so we'll hear about that later. Uh, and uh, anyway, 90 years old, took him to the dentist, and he asked her as they were getting ready to leave, could you help me get my shoes on? And she said, sure. And he looked at her while he she was putting the shoes on and said, I used to do this for you when you're a baby. And she said, I was just thinking the same thing and what a privilege and honor it is for me to help you now. Isn't that beautiful? That's just why people put up with me because I come with Claire and uh, so they put up with me. They say, we, well, you're okay, but we really like Claire. Beautiful example. She didn't know I was working on a sermon on the Ten Commandments when she did that. She honored her father. Not for anything he can do. He can't do much anymore. She honored her father because he is worthy of honor just because of the office that he holds. We don't honor people who are useful. We honor people in God's eyes who are useless just because of who they are. And we got to remember time isn't our own. And sometimes you just need to have some useless time. Even the people and the animals and the donkeys got a day off. Did you notice that? Everybody got a day off. The servants, everybody got a day off. Because one-seventh of your time should be spent in rest, not in the rat race, not staring at your phone, not watching TV. I've had people tell me, oh, I observe the Sabbath every Sunday. I watch sports from the moment I get up till I go to bed. No, that's not observing the Sabbath. Sabbath is resting and doing nothing but thinking about your blessings. And as for not bearing false witness, if people are useless, and what I mean by that is that we do what we do because of who they are created in God's image, then God is saying, you tell the truth. 
You tell the truth even if it means personal harm to you, even if it doesn't work to your advantage. You tell the truth because the truth is important in and of itself, whether it advances your cause or not. In other words, God says you have integrity. What a strange word to say in an election year in the United States of America. Integrity. Integrity means your word is your bond. Integrity means saying what you mean and meaning what you say. And saying it even if it doesn't work to your advantage because it's the right thing to do. Do not bear false witness, God says. So there you have it. It's my view of the Ten Commandments from 10,000 feet. God's rules are not given for his benefit so he can sit up there and say, well, let's see how they do. No, his rules are given for our benefit because we need them. Without them, the fabric of our lives will be torn. We learn that God isn't useful not to be used as an end in and of itself, but simply praised for who he is. And in doing that, we learn that one another is valuable just because we are created in God's image. And our lives become whole and the fabric becomes, that was torn becomes sewn. So loving God, loving one another, sisters and brothers, these are meet, right, and our bounden duty. Amen. On Communion Sunday, it is our practice to do the Nicene Creed. And I want you to notice this one was written when they had fully developed the doctrine of the Trinity. They decided that Jesus wasn't like God, but that Jesus was God. So notice how often they say that in through here. Please join me in standing as you are able for the Nicene Creed, the second most ancient creed of the church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, God's house does not operate according to the logic of the market, but according to the abundance of God's grace. So if Wall Street's up, we give. If Wall Street's down, we give because it's the right thing to do. Let each of us give what we have, trusting that by God's generosity it will be enough. Let us receive this morning's offering. And don't forget that the most important thing you put in that offering plate is your heart to love God with all your strength and might. Will the ushers please come forward for the receiving of the morning offering.
thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Receive our hearts and receive our morning offering as we give them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we prepare for the central act of worship at our service this morning, which is the Lord's table, let us turn to hymn number 508. You may remain seated as we sing and meditate on the words for the bread which you have broken. Am I still up there? I go, I'm, wow, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Uh, last month, people couldn't hear what I was saying, so I'm trying to make sure that I am, I've got it this time. But uh, anyway, it is my privilege to remind you that the Lord's Supper table is open to all who are believers, to all who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. It is not something that is for us alone. It belongs to our Lord. So you don't have to be a Presbyterian. You can be any kind of Tyrian you want. You can be a Terrier. Well, I don't know. I guess not Terriers. But you can be any kind of Tyrian you want and come to the Lord's Supper table if you love Jesus this morning. And we're going to do the great Thanksgiving. Not the old. I wish we still did that old one. I liked it. But uh, nobody understands it anymore. So we do an updated version of the great Thanksgiving to help prepare our hearts to receive from our Lord's table. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Praise to you, O God, for all of your works. You created the world and called it good and made us in your image to live with one another in love. You made a covenant with us by giving the Ten Commandments. And even when we turned from you, you remained faithful.
Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who lived among us and told us your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners and shared our pain and died our death, then rose to new life that we might live and all creation be restored. We remember now the words that the Apostle Paul wrote as he commemorated the Lord's Supper. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray for the bread. O oh, gracious God, we thank you that when the people, of the children of Israel were in the wilderness, you gave them manna, the bread of life. And now you give us the bread of life through Jesus. And we pause at this point and simply say thanks. Thanks not for the blessings you give us, but thanks for being our God. Thanks for being who you are. The God who sustains us, watches over us, and will bring us one day unto yourself. We thank you for the life of Jesus Christ, which we remember as we commemorate the Holy Bread. Amen. The Apostle continues, In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Join me in prayer for the cup. We give you thanks for this cup of blessing, O God. And we remember that we have torn the fabric of our lives. By our sins, we have torn up our relationship with you, and we have ripped apart our relationship with one another. And that is shown in the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross when he shed his blood. By your Holy Spirit, be present as we drink now from this cup, the sign of our Savior's blood poured out for us, and may it also be a sign of our desire during this time of Lent to turn our lives back toward you. As our bodies are refreshed by the fruit of the vine, so may our spirits be replenished by the very life of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The way we receive communion is... You can stay where you're seated and we'll bring it to you. Uh, or, as you are able, you can come down the center and I will give you the bread of life. And then you can split to the two sides and the uh, elders will serve you the cup. One will have a cup of wine or grape juice and the other one will have an empty tray that you can place it in as you then go back to your seats.
God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world, and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, do we have anything to pray about this week? <laughs> I say that word facetiously. Folks, we need to pray. We got a world that uh, needs our prayers uh, very, very much. What it needs is not our prayers, it needs God. But we're going to pray that God's grace and presence will be felt. We're about to go eat lunch. And uh, when you eat lunch today, think about the fact that no one is, that you're not starving to death as they are in Gaza and no one's trying to shoot you for trying to feed your family. What a tragic situation. Let's pray that God's grace will be felt there and in other places and other war zones. We pray for uh, other causes than just our own. But I know that you also come with a prayer request. How many of you have come with somebody really special on your heart this morning? Somebody that you're really praying for that God has just laid on your heart. So we come with those requests as well. And that is fine because Jesus notices the sparrows that fall in the desert. He certainly cares about the needs of our hearts. Let us come before God for the prayer of the people. O oh, gracious God. We thank you. We want to pause and just thank you. We want to thank you for being God. Before we make our request, we simply say, may your name be hallowed. We worship you now and worship you just for being you. But we do come with needs. Our world comes with needs. People who are trying to feed their families and are starving to death. People who are in war zones. Children and babies who can't get formula. Oh Lord, how we lift them before you and pray that somehow peace will descend like a dove from above where the war it ravages on. We pray for our world. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders both locally and nationally. We pray that you will give them wisdom and insight and the ability to do that which is best. We pray, O oh God, for ourselves. Some of us come here today with aches and pains that I can't even begin to imagine. Make it hard to get up, hard to move around, hard to be about the day's business. I pray for all of us who are in pain this morning. And then we all come with specific people on our hearts. Lord, they're just, sometimes they're relatives, sometimes they're friends, sometimes they're spouses, sometimes they're family members, sometimes they're a stranger that we saw by the edge of the road. They're all different kinds of people. We lift them into the presence of Jesus at this moment as we lift them before you in a moment of silent prayer. We thank you, O God, that we have received from your table this morning. We thank you that we have received the emblems that point to the life and death of Jesus Christ. And that we have received this reminder that just as bread brings energy to our lives, so the presence of Jesus in our hearts energizes our spirits and enables us to have eternal life. We thank you that all this is possible through Jesus Christ our Lord as we remember now the prayer that he taught his first disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of this shall be added unto you. These are the words of Jesus Christ. Please join me in standing as you are able.
I know I'm a Presbyterian, but sometimes when I worship God here at Broadmoor, I almost get excited. <laughs> Just almost. And then I calm down. I say, no, you're a Presbyterian. Just calm down. But isn't it exciting to be in the Lord's house, to receive from his table, to hear his holy word, to have people who can sing so beautifully as we have up in our loft right now? And I believe today, today did we go on Facebook Live? Did we go on Facebook Live? No, we did not. Okay, never mind that last part. Pretty soon we're going to go on Facebook Live as soon as we can figure out how to do it. So uh, uh, anyway, our service will be broadcast at the same identical moment uh, that we are worshiping in here rather than a 24 to 48 hour delay as we currently have. So stay tuned for that. As soon as a bunch of Presbyterians can figure it out, we will be doing that. It's been good to be in the Lord's house today. Good to see each one of you. Go with God's blessing. Go with the Trinitarian blessing. Let us bow our heads and hear the benediction of God. Body of Christ, go forth from this place, knowing that there is your Lord who sends you out into the world. Go forth, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be the very place where God's presence dwells. And as you go, may Christ's grace nurture your heart, God's justice guide your mind, and the Holy Spirit's power fill your every breath to the glory of our living Lord. Amen.